This video is a summary of the final preparation that you need to be doing in the lead up to your GCSE Chemistry Paper 2, whether it's a mock or the real thing, and whether it's combined science or the separate science exams. Hopefully you're close to completing your revision and you've had time to watch my full paper summary and also to use the recall questions to check that you know all of the facts in the specification. But this is more about how to make sure that you are calm, focused and prepared to tackle the exam. On the front of your exam paper, it tells you that you need a black pen, a ruler and a calculator. The black pen is important because your paper is going to be scanned and black ink scans so much better. The ruler is important not just for drawing lines of best fit, but also because you may be asked to measure something on the paper. So just a protractor or a straight edge isn't good enough. And you're going to need a scientific calculator because 20% of the marks in the GCSE chemistry exam are for mathematical skills. If you've managed to make it into school and you've forgotten one of these things, go find your science teacher or even your maths teacher before the exam starts and ask them to lend you something. Don't wait until you're in the exam because the invigilators may not have very much equipment that they can lend out and you don't want to have to do the exam missing one of these things. In the GCSE science exams, you're given one minute per mark plus an extra five minutes. So that means that before you start looking at the questions, you can spend a little bit of time getting your head straight and writing down some key things that are very likely to come up. For the GCSE chemistry exams, you're going to be given a copy of the periodic table. So you've got a piece of paper right there to scribble things on before you even look at the questions. For paper two, you're less likely to want to make lots of annotations on your periodic table. But don't forget, even though we often think of topics one to five as being paper one topics, the specification does say that atomic structure and bonding and basic quantitative chemistry can be examined on either paper. So it's still worth you making a couple of little notes to yourself. Things like where the metals and non-metals are, a reminder that the key does tell you that atomic number is the proton number and that in an atom, the number of protons and electrons is the same as each other. And a reminder that if you do get a question that asks you to calculate a relative formula mass, you need to be using the relative atomic mass, which is the number at the top. If you're taking triple science, it might also be a good idea to write down some things like the colours of the flame tests. At the start of the exam, it can be really easy to panic and find that your mind goes blank and things you thought you knew have suddenly fallen out of your head. One really good technique is to have a few key facts for each paper that are maybe things that are very likely to come up, like working scientifically skills and required practicals, or maybe they're things that historically you've got wrong and you really want to make sure you get right. And when you're allowed to start writing, before you look at the questions, you write down those key facts. This means that if you have a bit of a mind blank later, you've still got that to go back and look at to help you. And it also is quite a good way of stopping yourself from panicking and controlling those nerves at the start of the exam. Working scientifically skills are always a safe bet for this because they come up in every single paper and also because a lot of people don't revise them very thoroughly because they're concentrating on the subject specific knowledge and forgetting that these skills go across all six papers. So you might want to write things down like what the variables are. I can't remember who I borrowed mixed dry from, but it's a really good acronym for remembering that you modify the independent variable and that goes on the X axis. And then you watch to see what happens to the dependent variable and you record that and that goes on the Y axis. I always tell my classes that I'm a control freak. I don't like anything to change. So I always have the same seating plan and I always have the same PowerPoint when I'm teaching. So the control variables are the things that you're forcing to be the same in every single time that you do the experiment. You might want to write down some little conversions like how there are a thousand milligrams in a gram and a thousand micrograms in a milligram. And you might want to remind yourself of the difference between repeatable and reproducible. Remember, if you get the same pattern when the same people do exactly the same experiment, that's repeatable. But if a different group of scientists conduct the experiment, or maybe they use a slightly different technique, but they still see the same overall pattern, that's reproducible. For the rates topic, you might want a reminder that to calculate mean rate, you can do mass divided by time or volume divided by time, and that will give you rates in grams per second or centimetres cubed per second. You might want a reminder that the five key things that you can do to influence the rate of a reaction are change the pressure, the surface area, the concentration, add a catalyst or change the temperature. For all of those apart from catalyst, they're going to increase the frequency of successful collisions. And that's a really important word to remember. You always need to be talking about increasing frequency or how there are collisions happening more often, not just more collisions. We have to have a time aspect to that. 
If you're talking about um, the required practical, it's about changing the concentration. So you do that by diluting, by adding water, but you need to keep the overall volume the same. You also might want a little reminder about that fact that you have to be timing it. If we're thinking about equilibrium, you need to remember that Le Chatelier's principle tells you that the system will shift to counteract the change. And any question about equilibrium, when you're answering it, you should identify which reaction is favoured and therefore what happens to the position of equilibrium. For the organic chemistry topic, you might want to start by thinking about combustion and how complete combustion is where there's enough oxygen, but incomplete is where there's not enough. You might want a reminder that cracking will turn a larger alkane into a smaller alkane and an alkene. And you might want some general formulae for those alkanes and alkenes. You might also want to remind yourself that to test for alkenes or double bonds, bromine water changes from being orange to being colourless. Definitely not clear, definitely colourless. If you're taking the separate science exams, you might also want some reminders of some functional groups. For chemical analysis, you probably want to be thinking about the required practical for the chromatography. So it might be worth writing yourself a little reminder that your RF value must be between zero and one. So if you get a value that's larger than one, you've probably divided the numbers the wrong way around or maybe you haven't converted the units to be the same. So if one of your numbers is in millimetres and one of your numbers is in centimetres. You also might want to remind yourself that each spot represents a pure substance. So for instance, if you've got an ink and they give you three different spots, that tells you that that ink is made of three different colours. You might want to remind yourself that the start line is always drawn in pencil because pencil won't run and that the solvent needs to be below that pencil line. For the atmosphere topic, you might want some reminders about um, global warming and the greenhouse effect, how small wavelength waves can make it through that um, greenhouse layer. But these are then absorbed by the Earth and when they're re-emitted, they have a larger wavelength. And so those infrared rays are unable to pass through those greenhouse gases and therefore the Earth ends up warming up. You might want a reminder that sulphur dioxide and oxides of nitrogen can both dissolve in clouds to form acid rain and that the sulphur dioxide comes from burning sulphur impurities which are found in hydrocarbon fuels whereas oxides of nitrogen are made when nitrogen and oxygen from the atmosphere react together at high temperatures inside a combustion engine. For using resources you might want a reminder that phytomining is done using plants so P and P and bioleaching is done with bacteria so B and B but also it's worth being aware that for using resources, you're very likely to get questions which ask you to evaluate. And this is true across all of the papers. Whenever you see a question that asks you to evaluate, you need to compare the statements and you must write a conclusion. For every single evaluate question, there is always a mark available for writing a conclusion that is supported by the statements you've already made. So you should never leave it open. You should always say, oh, this one is the best one. There's far more here than you could possibly write down in the time you've got. So just pick out five key facts that you're particularly going to focus on. Practice writing them down a few times before the exam and walk into the exam knowing that they're the first thing that you're going to do. Then you're going to have a little bit of time to have a quick look through the paper and see what topics have come up. Before you start answering questions, just take a minute to look through the paper and see which topics have come up. In particular, look out for extended response questions, those four to six mark questions that are level marked rather than giving you one mark for every true thing that you've said. There's always going to be at least one of these because there's always one question that is shared as common between the foundation paper and the higher tier paper. The reason you want to find this is so that you can kind of be thinking about it in the back of your brain while you're answering other things and scribbling down notes as you go so that when you're finally ready to tackle it, you have everything laid out in your brain. Remember, there aren't any marks for writing in full sentences. Your answer needs to be structured in a logical order, but you're absolutely allowed to do that as bullet points or as a table. So if I was answering this question, I might have a little look at it and then go have a look at the rest of the paper. And I might decide that the best way to lay this out is going to be in a table where I talk about the early atmosphere and then I talk about the late atmosphere. And then I might go and answer some more questions. And a little bit later on, I might think, OK, well, I remember now that my current atmosphere is mainly nitrogen and some oxygen and a little bit of argon. And then I could go and answer some more of the paper. And then I might remember that the early atmosphere had lots of carbon dioxide in it. 
And a little bit later, it might occur to me that part of the reason that there's that difference is because there's been lots of photosynthesis. So I've been making that little plan as I go through the rest of the paper. And then when it's time for me to answer this, I've already got quite a few things that I know I can start writing about. I'm not just sat there staring at a blank sheet of paper. One thing you will notice that might be particularly relevant for doing these extended response questions is that it tells you not to write outside of the box. Again, this is because your paper is going to be scanned and there's a chance that your examiner won't be able to see what you've written. So it's really important that if you do run out of room, you don't start writing here in the margins and you especially don't try to use one of the blank pages somewhere else in your exam paper. This isn't like doing your mocks where your teacher can just look through and see everything that you've written. So if you do run out of room or if you need to start again because you've made a mistake, that's OK. You just need to ask the invigilators for some more paper and then they will fill in a form and your examiner will get that scanned as well with the rest of your paper. But don't go writing in the margins. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you're now feeling slightly more prepared for your GCSE chemistry exams. If you have found this useful, then don't forget to like and subscribe for more GCSE chemistry revision videos coming soon.